Well, good morning, Hope family. How's everyone doing? Oh, fantastic. Glad you guys are in house, or if you're joining online, glad that you're here with us today. We got a lot of exciting things in service for us. A couple cool organizations coming in, so I really want to encourage you guys, uh, whether you're here or even online, just to check out some of the organizations that are here that we can partner with and, and help out with. So let me pray. God, thank you that we get together today. Uh, that we get to just celebrate King Jesus, um, how your love is manifesting itself both inside and outside the local church. What a privilege it is to see that, Lord. And so, God, we're excited just to uh, participate in whatever capacity that is and, and witness your love move forward and penetrate the darkness. We love you, God. Amen. Well, good morning. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for joining us online. Um, those of you that are here, I'm going to invite you to stand. Um, just a quick reminder, we are, uh, uh, we do have the mask mandate, so we're requiring masks while we, while we hang out today. So uh, it's just another way for us to care for one another and care for our community. Let's start off this morning uh, with this song, Multiply.
song open the gate
with the full knowledge and confidence that you are our strength and that you know us completely, you know what we're working through, what we're walking through today and that you love us and you have us and we can lean into you. So God, as we sing these words of this song, see a victory, God, I would just pray that you would uh, just let us know that we can fully hope in you and in who you are and your love and your grace because we need it. So God, we just pray. everything that we do and say today will be directed towards you and your glory.
take a moment and just breathe in the presence of God right now. God, we need you. Shout to the Lord all the earth let us see power and majesty praise to the king mountains bow down and the seas we roar and the sound of your name I sing for joy at the work of your Forever I love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Come on, let's sing that chorus together. Shout to the Lord. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. with a religious pretense. We want to do this from child to a holy father, from servant to a holy, kind king, confident that you love us completely all the while knowing us completely. And we need more of that from you to us and from us to each other. Show us how to do that more and more and more. In your holy name we pray all of this. Amen. Thanks so much for worshiping. You can have a seat. All life is precious to you. From our first breath we inhale your love. At our last moments we exhale your name each one a child of the creator of all things. You come to us, God, as the light through the window after the long, dark night, the breathing in the silence, the voice in the storm. You are present in all things, in all times. You saw us in our mother's wombs. You watched us as children dance in the rain. And God, you tell us not to harvest the entire field. Leave the corners. Leave what grows in the corners for the widows, the strangers, the poor. We cannot shut each other out, God. We are your children. There are too many who wait in the corners for help, too long ignored, too long forgotten, too long alone. We will leave what grows in the corners for them, God. We will do this because we know what it's like to be in the corners and feel forgotten. Life is too precious, God. Life is a song we should dance to 
Life is the embrace of a loved one. Help us see your son when we look at each other. Help us be the hand up to those who have fallen. Help us be the calming voice to the loudest mind. None get ignored here, God. No one stays in the corners. Everyone is welcome at your table, Lord. Every last life sacred. Amen. Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning, John. Special welcome to you who are watching online and joining us that way, or a best special shout out to all of our Gillet folk who are gathering outside. Hey, great to have you here, everyone with us. Just a reminder as we head into this week, a lot of things going on. Remember, our, uh, we talked about it for a little while, growing bigger by growing smaller. And so we want to remind everyone, we got a ton of things happening, whether it's Tuesday night uh, family, Wednesday night youth, or Thursday night classes. In smaller gatherings, we can grow bigger in our faith. Also, remember uh, 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 an outline and some questions went out to you for your life group or for your home team. Make sure that uh, you connect with that. Pastor Todd sent that out Thursday, and there's all kinds of discussion questions. More than ever, we are encouraging, hey, in your small gatherings, in your safe gatherings, be ready to talk about what we're talking about here on Sunday morning. So having said that, we're in our series. We're calling it 58 Days of Compassion, and it's based upon Isaiah 58. And I know you hear me say this a lot, and I'm not just trying to market my own stuff here, all right? If you missed last Sunday, you need to watch it. If you're part of the whole family, you need to watch last week's message as it sets up really with where we're going today and in the weeks following. Because otherwise, you might be able to take it out of context. It would be real easy to do that. So last week, here's what we talked about, that all of us really need to do some work. I think we need to do some business with God around Isaiah 58. We need to be asking him for some conviction for our lack of compassion. And once again, we're going to be dealing with some issues that face our culture and our communities over the next weeks. My issue is not what our culture thinks of these things. I don't care about really what our larger community thinks. I care with what the church thinks and how the church is responding biblically. And so that means for those of us who have said yes to Jesus, are we responding compassionately to these issues in our lives? So, you know, you should have gotten, if you're part of the whole family, you should have gotten an email with a full list of our messages. Please, please, please understand that each and every one of those messages are going to be in the context of how the church responds. Does that make sense? How do we biblically respond to these issues? So you could think and take any one of the messages that we're talking about, and you could think just even for a second that, oh, there's some political agenda behind it. Trust me, that is not what's happening here. There's issues, <laughs> no matter what party you're a part of, there's issues on either side of, of everything that we're talking about. I am concerned with how the church is biblically responding to the community needs around us. So that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So today, we're going to be talking about, and by the way, <laughs> none of these issues we're going to be talking about are easy, okay? Yeah. And so I, I, I hope we would humbly approach them. I hope we would approach them with contrite hearts that say, God, would you help us? Would you really help us today? So today we're going to be talking about compassion for children. And so I have Dale Baston, who is an elder here at Hope, a longtime member. And as we talk about this, Dale has been a leader in this issue, not just in giving messages to all of us, but also by how he has lived his life. He and his family have put this into action. So quick, Dale, uh, for those who don't know you, give, me, give us all a quick uh, introduction to who you are. Great. Thanks, John. Well, my wife and I, Kim... My wife Kim and I, sorry, have been married for uh, 28 years, and uh, I'm so thankful that God has blessed me with a wife who I get to do life with. Uh, she has a big heart, and God has used her to grow compassion in my own life. Now, uh, God has blessed us with six children, uh, ages 24 to 14. Uh, my oldest son is married, and so now we have a wonderful daughter-in-law as well. My next two children are at Stout uh, in college, and my three youngest are in Bondwell in high school. 
And so I have three boys and, and three girls and, and plenty of chaos to boot with it. Now I'm a software developer by trade, but where my passion really is, is for children. But it always hasn't been that way. God has, has developed that in me over time through little choices and obedience that I've taken. And as I was thinking about compassion this week, I was reminded of a verse in Matthew 9. Many of you are very familiar with it. Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And if you look at the two verses prior to that, Jesus was going to all the villages and surrounding communities, teaching, sharing the gospel, and healing the sick. And it says that when he saw the crowds that had gathered, he had compassion on them. And what I want to highlight is just two words in those verses. Jesus went and he saw. He went and he saw, and that's what caused him to have compassion. And that's really how it started for me. When Kim and I were first married, maybe uh, four years, uh, we went to go visit uh, a weekend with some friends of ours who were foster parents of a child that had some special needs due to fetal alcohol syndrome. I went and I saw. And what I saw was love in action. I saw two parents being totally compassionate to this child with needs. And God used that weekend to draw Kim and I down this road of fostering for 10 years. And eventually, we adopted our two youngest children from West Africa. Kim and I have been advocates for orphans and at-risk children, and we've tried to wave the banner high so that others in our church might go and see. And my challenge to you is, if, if you feel your heart or your mind just checking out right now, just confess that. Allow the Spirit of God to move. Pray that God would soften your heart, because my hope is that you'll be challenged to peer into our Lord's heart as it relates to children. So I, I don't know about all of you, but I'm super glad Dale could join us because uh, this is somebody and whose family has not just talked about compassion toward kids, but they have demonstrated it. So I hope, you know, around all of this that, remember my challenge last week, I, I really hope that you have prayerfully dove into Isaiah 58 and, and remember, remember what happened, it was happening there. God is specifically speaking to the nation of Israel who were in their worship were being pious, but they were pretending. And in, in the midst of it, they had been practicing this practice called fasting, meaning they're putting on hardship on themselves, but they were ignoring the hardship and the oppression all around them in their community. So here's the verse again. I want you to hear it with fresh ears. Isaiah 58, verse 6. No, this is the kind of fasting I want. This is the kind of worship I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free. Remove the chains or the yoke that binds people. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be asking, not just let's talk about it, but what is our compassionate response to those who are oppressed, to those who need to be free? So open your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 10, especially as we talk about compassion around children, or if you have a, a smartphone, go to the U version, Y-O-U version Bible app, especially if you're watching online. If you find the events tab, it should come in with our region, Hope Community Church Shano. Click on that and boom, all the notes will come on up. So Mark chapter 10, uh, here's how Jesus showed compassion to children. This is a familiar story to many of you. One day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them, but the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. He said, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. As you hear that again, what jumps out at you in that passage? Are you alarmed? I mean, I think I'm alarmed, right? That, oh, how could these disciples shut down these kids, these cute little kids, you know? Are you amazed at Jesus' response? Dale, what, what jumps out at you in this? Well, we've all been there, John. Inevitably, I've never been there. <laughs> inevitably, when I'm trying to have a conversation at church, that's when my kids decide to start wrestling or start fighting with each other or going to start playing tag and interrupting. And... I used to get so bent out of shape when they did that because yeah. I felt it was a poor reflection of me as a parent. But it was. It, yeah, no, it was. I'm it was kidding. all about me. Totally <laughs> kidding. But God, 
worked on my heart in that area, and I soon realized other people's kids did the same thing, and, and sometimes kids will be kids. And, you know, I'm all about correcting and disciplining, but there's just a beautiful thing about a child's heart and its energy and its passions. So as we look at the scripture in Mark 10 uh, and the culture of Jesus' time, children had no status. Today is vastly different. We do everything for our kids. Uh, as the saying goes, the kids rule the roost. And if we were to look at our calendars, we'd see that a lot of it's centered around the activities that we have our children in. But in Jesus' time, it was easy to ignore them. No one took up their causes or would speak up for them for the troubles that they were experiencing. Children really did not have a voice and were not able to defend themselves. And so, in any kind of public ministry, the disciples were just doing what the culture deemed important. Namely, Jesus doesn't have time for children or their issues. The disciples were trying to be important and do important things. And certainly, these kids were not important. And what should be shocking and surprising to us is just how angry Jesus got. He was really ticked off. And he was mostly angry that his own followers were not allowing them to partake in his ministry. And this story just reveals the love that Christ has for children. Nothing is more endearing than imagining a child up on Jesus' lap. But it is also a deeper, deeper revelation of, of Christ's own divine nature, the heart of God. And we can learn a lot from a child. As the church, we are the children of God. And like a child, there should be this dependence, this trust, this simplicity as we follow Christ. And it's only with that Christ-like and childlike attitude that we can experience all that God has for us, the side of heaven. Do, do, do you see the context here? You, are you noticing context within the gospel? Who does Jesus minister to? The hurting? The oppressed? The weak? Those who don't in society have any voice today? So I want us to learn from Jesus' interaction here, how do we then? How do we, if we've said yes to Jesus, how should we follow him and have compassion for, for kids? So that's the very, you know, simple question today uh, is this. How can I show compassion to the oppressed, right? Isaiah, oppressed. We can notice children, at-risk kids who are oppressed in our culture today. First of all, number one, we need to affirm that their lives are incredibly valuable to God. Jesus just clearly shows this. A kid's, a child's life is incredibly valuable. Verse 14, when Jesus saw, remember what Dale said, he went and he saw, when he saw what was happening, he was angry. In other words, he was paying attention to what was going on, and it wasn't just some words he, he spoke. He had some real conviction that caused him to act, and his action was he took the child and placed them in his arms, and he blessed them. You know, so, so often in our culture today and the culture back then, we ascribe value to what? Me receiving something back. Or we ascribe value to something that feels like it's important based on somebody's performance. If you've accomplished something, you're valuable. So, you know, our culture, we admire the athlete. We admire the celebrity. We even admire someone who was maybe even born into royalty, Think about what we honor in our families, you know, those who are connected to us, parents who have loved us, brothers and sisters. We even ascribe value to friends if they treat us right, but they are doing something to get that value. Here Jesus is saying, it's not about what you're doing. You have value simply because you are a child of God. It doesn't matter how important you think you are. It doesn't matter how important others think you are. You have intrinsic value simply as being a child. And so I think, don't you, this is a great way to start off our compassion series. Do we have compassion for those who do not benefit us in any way? Who simply hold that intrinsic value of life? So how do we put that to action? as a church? How do we begin to you know, place a high value on what Jesus places a high value on? I think it begins with this. I think we need to say that all life, all life matters to God, even a child's life. And, and just so you know, let me be clear on this. We believe this is a biblical truth. Here at Hope, we believe that 
value begins even with an unborn child. Value begins, we at Hope and churches around the world, we believe here that life begins at conception. Once again, this isn't an opinion based upon culture or politics, but rather what is based upon we believe in God's word. And we think it's very clear. So here's one verse that would speak to this. Psalm 139, verse 13. You'll see it up on the screen. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit them together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion and as I was woven together in the dark of my womb. The question I want us to ask today is how do we as a church hold up that value? And for certain, right, for certain the church has been a voice to this oppressed people group. And, and over the years, the church has made very clear pro-life claims through, you know, pro-life initiatives. And, and I know many of you hold those strong convictions as it relates to your voice and as it relates to your vote. And that's great. But here's what we did as an elder team this last year. We asked the question, is that all we can do? What would it look like for us to move more compassionately and do more? How can we say that as a church, not only are we pro-life, but we're pro-love and grace to this issue? So Dale, you've been on the elder team through this process as we work through this. What are some of the things, you just want to share with everybody, what are some of the things that we talked about? What are some of the things that we prayed about? Sure. As an elder team, one of our primary responsibilities is to oversee the teaching of sound doctrine, and we want to ensure that the Bible is taught accurately in all of Hope's ministries, and so we take that responsibility very seriously, and, and with the Lord's help and humbly, we do that. As a church, we are pro-life because we serve a God who unquestionably values life from conception, as John read from Psalm 139, to our very last breath. God is the creator of all life and it is good. And, but sin has entered our world and has been corrupting it for generations. And, and the terms abortion and pro-life have become highly politicized. And it's very hard to even mention those words without some polarizing thought entering our minds. And so as an elder team, we began to individually pray and search out scripture to see what it has to say. And so we together developed this position paper uh, declaring Hope Community's Church pro-life stance. In the U.S. alone, there are over 600,000 abortions a year of children with no voice. In light of Isaiah 58, that is a pretty impressive number, a pretty oppressive group. And in our society, we, we want to talk about the unborn or orphan. When we talk about that, when we talk about the unborn or when we talk about orphans or, or children at risk, it's in a part of society that we don't see. And like I'm calling you to do, we need to go and we need to see. Unless we become awakened as a church, we're not going to be changed and our, we're not going to grow in compassion with regards to the unborn. But before I continue, I want to speak to that abortion number. The latest statistics are that one in four women has had an abortion. So if we're being humble and honest, that includes some of you who are listening right now. You're experiencing shame or physical pain or emotional pain. Perhaps you're carrying around a secret that's causing you struggles in your life. And I just want to say as the church that we love you and we will respond humbly and without condemnation. You are not alone. We want to grow in compassion for you. Now, in this position paper the elder team put together, it's, it's a call to action. We want to not only be pro-life, but pro-love. And so we prayed about what things we could do, and there was just a strong desire that we wanted to, to per, partake or participate in a crisis pregnancy center. We wanted to come alongside. And so how can we show love to those who are struggling? We now entered into a partnership with Vita in Appleton. Vita is Fox Valley Mother and Unborn Baby Care Organization. And this past Thursday, Pastor John and I had the privilege of going 
uh, to meet with uh, their staff, to see their facilities, and hear the amazing things that God is doing through their ministry. And we, are see we could see just practically how they are providing love and support for women and children in need. And, and so we were able, thanks to your generosity, we were able to pass along some of that support to help contribute to the ministry that Vita is already doing. And we are trusting that God is going to continue to grow that ministry to reach more people in the Shano community and surrounding areas. And the final call to action as an elder team, we felt led to start an Embrace Grace support group. Now, Embrace Grace is a national organization of women that provides support and help to come alongside uh, women who are, find themselves pregnant. And we want to use that group to provide a 12-week study for women to help them through their pregnancy. And there's a 24-week study that can be used to help after birth and those early years. And it provides uh, both spiritual, physical, and emotional support. And so to the women out there, if, if you're listening and God's maybe speaking to your heart regarding this and you feel like God might want to help you lead one of those groups, uh, please contact the church office. I, I hope you're hearing the heart of the leadership here at Hope. It, it's got to be more than just our rhetoric. Are, are you hearing that? We want to take some, some action that is compassionate. You know, having a child is an incredible, <laughs> you know this, it's an incredibly stressful time, especially if you're, if you're, if you're new mom and dad. And, and imagine, especially if it wasn't planned. So how can we show love and support in a pro-life way? Not just by words, but by our actions. So yes, we as a church are supporting Vita, and, and I know they're down in Appleton, but having a conversation with them, they help many people who are up north. At, uh, north, we're up north, by the way. And... And in doing so, they want to create partnerships with churches so as that they are done with that support, they can then move those uh, families to a church. And so we're connecting with them. So today, there's a table set up in the commons. Uh, Jen Armour is there. She has been a mentor there, helping a lot of these uh, moms uh, give them some mentorship. She'll be at that table. If that sparks any interest in you, go talk to her. How could you do something practical that could help them? Also, there is a sign-up over by the HOPE sign for this Embrace Grace support group. So this is for women only, right? We want to have the women come together who this is a passion for so that how you can help some other women. Just put your name down. We can get some information to get that up and going. All right, but there's still more. You might say, well, I, I, I'm not going to go down to Appleton. Uh, you know, I don't know really what to do. You can pray. Can you pray? All right, there are ways that we can help through prayer. And so our elder team began this journey because one of our other leaders, Vince Studer, if you know Vince, you know Vince? Vince mm -hmm. Studer, uh, he came to the elder team and, and wanted to share a ministry that he was involved with. It's called 40 Days for Life. And so just so you know, this is not some political protest ministry, but rather it's a simple prayer ministry where you get to know some other Christians from the area that just want to gather together and pray. And here's what they've seen. This is a national organization, but they have seen that prayer changes things. Prayer changes lives. Prayer changes community. It's about expressing love and compassion through prayer. And Vince has met a lot of great people through this. So if that interests you at all, Vince will be back at a table as well to talk to you about that. We want you to take the information you're hearing and not just give voice to it, but to put action to it. So how do we do that? God has placed an incredible value on children, especially those who are at risk and who are oppressed. So if this is a passion of yours, stop by one of those tables, but there's more, right? There's more we can do around this issue. How can I show, number two, how can I show compassion to, uh, to at-risk kids? Affirm their value, that's what we've been talking about, by investment. Investment of your time and resources. Look what Jesus said, and then look at what he did. He said to them, let the children come to me, don't stop them. In other words, open the door to kids coming to know me, don't stop them, and then he did something. He invited them and he brought them to himself. He said, I will, and this, you know, he's preaching, people are being healed, he's doing all kinds of miracles, and he said, I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to stop, and I'm going to invest my time into kids. See, as Dale said, Jesus is communicating the very heart of God. 
And this is, this, is not, this is not something new about God. This was God's command for the people of Israel way back in the time of Moses. Look with me. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and Lord of lords. He is a great God. He is mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and cannot be bribed. This is God, in other words, is a huge God. And then all of a sudden it says this. He ensures that orphans and widows receive justice. He shows love to foreigners living among you and gives them food and clothing. This is the very heartbeat of God from beginning of the Bible to the end. Is it our heartbeat as a church? So Dale, from your own study, uh, this verse is important to you, but uh, you know there are at-risk kids mm -hmm. all around us, right? Yeah. So tell us a little bit about how your response has been. Well, have you ever heard of a problem just so great that you just kind of gave up before you put any effort into it? Think of poverty or the breakdown of the family and the skyrocketing divorce. Could my effort even make a difference? If that's ever crossed your mind, if that thought, then you're a lot like me. Uh, did you know that there are roughly half a million children in foster care right now in the United States? And there's over 140 million orphans worldwide. Those are staggering numbers. And in our society, we are plagued with busyness. There is neither rich nor poor when it comes to time. And in fact, God says, be careful how you use your time, for these days are evil. We are all entrusted with 24 hours a day. And I'm busy, just like you. And for me, it just came down to a simple conversation I had with God. As God first impressed on me a vision uh, for children, when I saw our friends as foster parents, basically I replied to my mind, I think I could do that. There wasn't this amazing uh, voice from heaven saying, Dale, go be a foster parent. There wasn't this strong conviction. I just took some time, filled out some paperwork, and got approved. Kim and I did foster care of infants, and so we would get children right out of the hospital and care for them for six to eight weeks. Uh, and when I held that first child for the very first time, it was just a beautiful thing. There's so many unknowns and so many possibilities with a child. Could this child grow up and cure cancer? Was this child going to be a famous athlete? But as I looked at this child, my heart began to break. There was so much uncertainty. Who are his parents? Who is going to protect them? Who is going to provide for them? They had no idea of their circumstances. Their only care in the world was to sleep, eat, and poop. God certainly helped me to love to serve in that capacity. An infant from six to eight weeks doesn't give a whole lot back. In fact, they're very needy. And so you might get this smile, but oops, it's just gas. And so it was really just a blessing in our lives to be able to give in that capacity. We were able to encourage and bless adoptive parents. We were able to love on these kids. And the great thing was we were able to demonstrate to our kids how to love and serve in a practical way. Through the foster care experience, uh, we were introduced to adoption. Uh, we saw the anticipation and excitement on these adoptive couples' faces. And through foster care, I learned that I could love these kids. But adoption is a whole nother level. There's a lot more costs. There's more paperwork. We already had children. What would our family think? There were just a lot of questions. But back to my first statement, there is an orphan crisis in the world. And God was not calling me to solve the orphan crisis. He was just asking me to solve the orphan crisis for one. And as God continued to work on my heart, we came to a point where we were ready to adopt and take that step of faith. We can romanticize adoption and foster care, but it can be really hard work. And if you would take time to hear and see some of the stories, I think God would do a work in your heart. Children are the most vulnerable in our society. And most children in foster care uh, who get bounced around and never find a forever family, they end up in teen pregnancy. They end up in poverty. They end up sex trafficked or they end up incarcerated. You and me as a church, we can make a difference. 
but there is also at-risk kids in our own community. Jesus said, do not hinder the children from coming to me. We need to be a safe place for kids to meet. Know your neighborhood. Take time. Listen to them. Enter into their world. Kids just need to know that someone cares. And so John's going to continue talking about that. Yeah, so when you hear that term foster care, right, or you hear that term adoption, it just feels huge, doesn't it? It just feels like a huge commitment. But even in hearing that, I, I just really believe that there are some of you that God is calling to that ministry, and that's a huge calling. So my, my encouragement to you is just to press into prayer. My encouragement to you is to set some side, time aside, meet with mm -hmm. Dale. Dale will be happy to spend yeah. as much time as you need. He can walk you through just having conversations of all the information that you need. But even in all of that, okay, you might be saying, okay, that's not me. That's not my life stage right now. Uh, what else can I do? There are some great ways that you can practically help at-risk kids in our own community. And so, hey, I am super excited because Big Brothers and Big Sisters of Northeast Wisconsin is here today. There is a table out there for them. And how many of you heard of Big Brothers Big Sisters, right? Everybody, right? Everyone's heard of them. It's this awesome organization where you get to come alongside and be a mentor, be a big to a, a, a little girl or a little boy and just spend some quality time investing in them and mentoring them. So currently, uh, from what I read, there's over 80 kids that they're, they're doing this with in our community. It's helping. What's it doing? It's saying, we uphold you. You've done nothing for me, but intrinsically, you're a child of God, and so I want to hold you up in value. So, hey, I want to encourage you today, go out to that table. If you just even have questions or had a thought, what, it, what does it mean for me to give a few hours a week to be a mentor to a child? Go out and ask questions. Just grab some material and pray. Once again, we are saying, let us be more than just rhetoric around this issue. Let us take action as a church. So, so here at Hope also, right, you know kids are important to us. And more than ever before, especially during this time of COVID, right, as, as we gather people back to worship, we need your help as well with the ministries here at Hope. From Sunday morning worship to our Thursday night of classes and, and pretty much everything. If you have a heart for kids, there are places and spaces you can just volunteer to minister to them in safe ways. So I know, you know, this call to action, right, it, it, it feels uh, like, oh, all right, I've heard this before, what am I supposed to do with this? Here's my last point. What is our motivation behind it? Do we want to just be known as good people? Is this just a bunch of do-gooding? No, it leads me to number three, how are we able to help at-risk kids? Because we affirm, right, we affirm that my time and my resources are inspired by my faith. You see how this builds? First, we realize that kids have value to God. Then we realize that, okay, God, you know, you're calling me. Jesus invested of his time and resources. I need to follow you on that. So what's my motivation? How can I be inspired? We really believe this is inspired by your faith in Christ. Look with me, verse 14 again. For the kingdom of God. This is all about the kingdom of God through Jesus, belongs to those who are like these little children. In other words, Jesus compares us as his followers to little children. We're weak. We're vulnerable. We need help. We need to see our need for Jesus. And so that's the only thing. As we see our need for Jesus, Jesus begins to do a work in our heart, and then he opens our eyes to the needs around us. And he is our only hope that will empower us to, to make our worship of God more than just talk, more than just songs on Sunday morning. One of the early church leaders, his name was James. Here's what he wrote to the church. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means what? So pure faith means this, caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Dale, this is another verse mm -hmm. <laughs> that I, I know you've said, I've heard you talk about it, that's important to you. You know, what, what, what should we learn from that? How is this an outflow of your faith, your ministry to kids? Yeah, when James included the words orphan and widow, he was talking about the most vulnerable in society at that time. And, and like I mentioned earlier, I still believe children are the most vulnerable in our society. And Jesus entrusts us, the church, to be his hands and feet. Prior to receiving Christ, I would have never imagined myself going to the Philippines, 
going to Haiti or going to Liberia, West Africa. But Christ, who has called us, has given us a mission to go to the ends of the earth and share the gospel. In the Philippines, I was able to meet with John Ray, who I support through Compassion International. Mm. In Haiti, I was able to meet Sarah, who we support through Beyond Our Door Global. And in Liberia, I was able to hold my son and daughter for the very first time. Each time it took a step of faith. First it took a step of faith to set aside the resources to support them. And then it took a step of faith to go and to see them. Through sponsorship, they have their basic needs met and they, they hear the gospel. And by going to see them, I was able to tell them that they matter and that there's a God in heaven who would send a stranger halfway around the world to tell them that he loves them. And every day, I get the privilege of saying to my son and daughter, I love them. God may not be calling you to do the things that, that I've done, but there may be a, a child in your neighborhood whose parents are recently divorced and, and the mothers work in two jobs just to make ends meet. Their yard's a mess and their house is a mess and, and the child's home alone a lot. And it's going to take a step of faith to walk across the street and enter their world. And when you enter their world, it will break your heart. And that's exactly where God wants you to be. Because it's only when our heart is broken that we're ready to love. James 1.22 says, But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, we're just fooling ourselves. Compassion requires action. Action requires faith. And when we act out in faith to do the things that God has called the church to do, we will experience blessing in the process. The adoption of our two children has helped me to understand the gospel more than I ever could imagine and to really see God as my Abba Father. God saw fit to adopt you and I into his family. We were lost, we were vulnerable, and we had nothing to offer. But God had compassion on us and he redeemed us and paid for our adoption through the life-giving blood of his son. And now we are co-heirs and enjoy all the benefits and privileges as sons and daughters. To God be the glory. Amen. Around all of these things with kids, what is God doing in your heart? But what might be God challenging you to do right now? Like Dale said, maybe it's in your neighborhood. Maybe it's with a team that you coach. Uh, maybe it's taking a, a, a bigger step. Let me just conclude with these words of Jesus. And uh, later on in the, this week, during our little, in case you don't know, way, I got some morning videos we're kicking out around these issues. But this verse jumps out at me. Here is our calling. Jesus says very clearly, you must be compassionate how? What's the level of compassion should we have? As your heavenly Father is compassionate. So the only way that I can be compassionate is if I realize the compassion the Father has had toward me. Mm -hmm. And then he calls me to levels of compassion that I could never dream of accomplishing. Never, never could dream of getting there. Very often, right, in our neighborhoods, kids drive by with the loud music, or they look a little bit different. Oh, kids these days, blah, 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 blah. You should be on grumpier old men. That's what you should be on. God's not calling us to that. Is that how God views them? Ah, what conviction around this. Once again, this just ought to cause us to go to our knees and say, Jesus, wow. You're calling us to something so much more than I could ever be or do. Would you help me? Would you help me to go and understand? And when we see and understand, then God gives us the ability to respond. Can we just pray around this this morning? God, we thank you for your word. We thank you how much you love kids. For all of us, there's an opportunity here to respond. For each and every one of us, there's an opportunity to respond, not just with our words, not just with our rhetoric, but with action to show compassion. And Jesus, this won't be about us. Let this be about you. For your glory and for your kingdom, we pray. Amen. Amen.
Amen. I just want a reminder, uh, this morning, offering buckets are there for on your way out. Remember what we're saying to you. If you have a need, please let us know during this time. We have some resources as a church that can help you. But if you have means, we do ask that you would please give. Don't leave quite yet. I want you to kind of wrestle with what we've been talking about. Allow God to work on your heart as Jared ministers to us with this song. He is jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending the knee The weight of his wind and mercy when All of a sudden I am unaware These afflictions eclipse my glory Realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us so. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. And all of a sudden, I am unaware these afflictions eclipsed by glory. Lies just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us so. Yeah, he loves as we've heard these words, this message, this story, God, may it motivate us to go from this place and turn words and feelings and passions into action. In your name, amen. Have a good one. Four seasons of winter and you'd give anything to feel the sun.